to move on to segment three now, uh, we're going to discuss recent advances on unmet challenges in peripheral T cell lymphomas. So just as a little bit of a background, PTCL uh, are a diverse family of lymphoid neoplasms that represent approximately 6 to 10 percent of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and are associated with poor prognosis. Prelotrexate is a folate analog metabolic inhibitor which was granted FDA approval in the autumn of 2009 as the first drug for the treatment of patients with relapse or refractory PTCL. Romadepsin, Romadepsin, an HDAC inhibitor, was approved later that same month in 2009 also for the treatment of patients with relapse or refractory PTCL. And bertuximab uh, vidotin, as we have been discussing uh, this morning, uh, today's CD30 antibody drug conjugate, received FDA approval in August 2011 for the treatment of patients also with relapse or refractory PTCL. So studies are ongoing to evaluate the efficacy and safety of new agents in combination regimens for both newly diagnosed and those patients with relapse refractory disease. So with respect to that, I think we should discuss uh, perhaps what the panel's ex uh, basically experience has been with using some of these agents. And for in particular, let's start with Romadepsin. And I'd like to start with Andre and saying, how do you incorporate Romadepsin in the treatment of uh, your peripheral T cell lymphoma patients? Yeah, my, I think Romadepsin is a very unique drug in patients for uh, both uh, cutaneous and systemic T cell lymphomas. And uh, based on the studies and our experience after the drug approval, it has some very important attributes to use in certain clinical situations. It's a biologic drug. It has very good tolerance. It does not have significant myelosuppressive properties. And what's even more important, does not have cumulative toxicity to the bone marrow, other cumulative toxicity. So in patients in whom you see activity of this agent, you can continue using the drug for very long periods of time. And I think uh, on the global scale, there are some patients who received Romadepsin for several years, uh, receiving clinical benefit without significant accumulation of the, of the side effects. So, and finally, I think, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, using this drug, uh, uh, sequentially with other new agents in T-cell lymphoma might potentially sensitize tumor cells by permanently changing their gene expression profile and potentially breaking toxicity for subsequent drugs that you use in these patients. So I personally find the biggest use of Remedepsin in a palliative setting, first of all, for older patients, patients who failed prior autologous allogeneic transplant for T-cell lymphomas, who are where we're most focused on quality of life and improvement in disease status and uh, controlling uh, disease, sustaining the responses. And what we've seen with Remedepsin, it's remarkable that some of the patients who actually achieve complete remission can be in remission for a very long period of time, months and months, sometimes years. In fact, the updated analysis of the registrational trial of Remedepsin showed that attainment of CR is a predictor of very long duration of response. Unfortunately, we only have uh, about 15% of patients getting there. However, if you're one of those patients, it's an ideal drug to maintain. And what we also observed in that study, uh, because it was going on for such a long time and patients were treated for sometimes several years, we allowed de-escalation of the schedule after a couple of years. And even when you space out the infusion and you don't do it weekly, three out of four weeks, but do it on a monthly schedule, a lot of those patients continue to be in remission. And that was my experience also in my clinic, and it's especially important for patients with cutaneous lymphoma, where quality of life is so important, and many patients with um, Cesare syndrome and advanced cutaneous lymphomas that you achieve remission, you can maintain this patient sometimes for years, which is uh, something really new in, in CTCL. So Any cumulative toxicity that you're concerned about? Um, um, we have not seen, actually, not okay. much at all of myelosuppression sure. or uh, neuropathy or mucositis that you see with other agents. So if patients tolerate drug well, they most likely will tolerate it uh, the same way after multiple cycles. Fatigue is prominent. And the other thing that we have observed in many patients, I think, was underreported uh, in the studies because investigators didn't ask. It's not something you ask all the time. It's taste changes. But you actually ask patients. I think it's 90% plus. Almost everybody complains that for a couple of days, patients do not eat. And it's not because of the nausea, vomiting, but things just don't taste well. Not even water. People even have trouble drinking water because the taste is so distorted. So I always counsel patients about uh, this two, three 
three days of reduced intake and uh, encourage them to drink a lot of fluids and then they catch up after three or four days the the taste comes back so it's not the damage to the taste buds I believe but it's probably some chemical effect on the on the taste and uh, fatigue is also prominent especially in older patients and you pick up more fatigue as you go to week three and week four and uh, but I found that if you reduce the dose uh, or de-escalate the schedule, as I mentioned, a lot of patients will be able to tolerate uh, treatment and remain on therapy and receive benefits. We also found that uh, this drug does not have significant impact on stem cell collection. Some of the younger patients who failed several salvage treatments and went on remidepsin and miraculously are one of those 15% of patients achieved complete remission. We did take them to transplant. And some of the patients, we collected stem cells and we analyzed stem cells. We actually reported that out of the T-cell meetings, we didn't have any problems with composition of the stem cell product or engraftment after the transplant. So potentially it can be used as a salvage prior to autologous or allogeneic transplant. So I think there are multiple uses of the drug. We are very excited to have a study now with uh, Steve of maintenance after transplant that I think might improve the outcomes because of the uniqueness of biologic action. This is epigenetic drug, so if we affect the tumor stem cells, that's the idea. We might be able to uh, affect how patients, how long they stay in remission, or maybe cure, even cure more patients with the transplantation. So I think there are multiple niches where remidepsin is so useful. I think the problem is that we did not pick up fatigue as well is that most of the clinicians are just as tired, maybe more tired <laughs> than the patients sometimes. But that aside, it was interesting that some of our colleagues in the community, uh, not only community, but uh, some of the academic uh, experience was that uh, there is actually in the NCCN guidelines a uh, thing about treating cancer fatigue. The only reason I bring it up is that in some cases, low dose Ritalin or Provigil actually, actually has activity. And I've tried it in a couple patients who had very good responses to uh, HDAC inhibitor, but unfortunately the fatigue was getting to the point where they were ready to stop therapy, not because of the toxicity of blood work or anything, it's just that fatigue was overwhelming. And I've tried these low dose uh, therapies and actually were able to maintain them on treatment. Again, it'll be different when we probably, as, as mentioned before, when we use it in combination therapy and we don't have that class effect when we use it just as a single agent for long periods of time, it'll probably be less of a problem, I would have to think. And I. Yes, Laura? I think there's a, a lot of different ways you could use romadepsin. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think uh, should be kept in mind is that it, it seems to work particularly well in angioimmunoblastic lymphoma. You might think about using it even up front in a patient who, who is very elderly where you mm -hmm. do not believe that they're going to tolerate chemotherapy, they're not going to go to transplantation. Gotcha. Um, and and uh, that's a group of patients that is sometimes very needy in terms of treatment options. The other thing is, is transform mycosis fungoides, which is another very needy kind of po patient population. That's a very good point. I mean, I think also, and, and, and I'll just mention it to Steve, is that we have to keep in mind, and we know this, but that when we're dealing with patients with uh, PTCL, we're dealing with a hodgepodge of patients with, uh, and the biology and the natural biology and the, the, the natural history of these subtypes can be very diverse and very different. And, and it just po the point goes home that the most common peripheral T cell is not otherwise specified, is that's the most common type. And I was just wondering, maybe ask Steve, is there any subtypes of your expo experience with uh, HDAC inhibitors that, as we mentioned before with Lauren, the uh, IATL seem to do somewhat better. Do you have any signals where some of these patients might need to be on other therapy other than HDAC inhibitors that had lower experience or? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think, I think we're, we're sort of so preliminary in understanding of these diseases. And, and just like you said, peripheral T-cell lymphoma unspecified is a, is a variety of diseases. There's some uh, data at this meeting uh, um, looking at um, some uh, sequencing analysis. Um, so I, I think in a very general way, what we're seeing is angiomunoblastic uh, T-cell lymphoma. Those patients uh, more frequently have mutations in epigenetic modifiers. And it's a little hand-waving, but that may sort of get at why we particularly see some good activity with HDAC inhibitors. One of the newer HDAC inhibitors, not yet, yet approved, Belinistat, which had a similar response rate to the others, was particularly high in angiomunoblastic. There's a subset of peripheral T-cell lymphoma unspecified that has more of this same signature, more like an angiomunoblastic or what's called a follicular helper T-cell phenotype on these, uh, on these mutation analysis. Um, so I, I think we're getting into a sense that we may have to start subdividing, but in terms of connecting the dots as to the reason why, 
I think we're I think we're 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 pretty early and still largely in the dark with with T cell. And I, I have to say that um, I just saw recently at the meeting uh, this, this meeting Randy Gasquin, He says there's going to be some uh, major publications looking at gene expression profiling with the, with respect to looking at the differences between the various uh, subtypes of PTCL that apparently are going to be very exciting. This, this, this rumor has been out yes. there since the summer, so these papers must be in review because I've heard yeah. this from several sources but have not yet seen the data yet. Yeah, so we're anxiously awaiting to see what that's going to show us. I'd like to say, will, will any of us use uh, basically, uh, well, let's go back to PTCL. So we have a patient up front, and let's ask the pros and cons. You have a patient, uh, and we end up getting them to remission. Do you recommend using autologous stem cell transplant as uh, consolidation therapy in first remission? Let's say, what are the pros for that? Let me go with you, Steve, first. Yeah, so I think one of the issues we have in T-cell lymphoma, the first major problem is that a lot of our patients don't do very well. The second major problem is we don't have large randomized data. So, so we're really operating based on um, um, subset analysis, impression, phase two, things like that. You know, in, in, to kind of gloss over a lot of sort of uh, uh, subtleties, you know, in, in my experience and in our personal experience and in some of the phase two trials, you know, I see the best sort of phase two data in terms of curing patients is with combination chemotherapy, probably adding atopicide, and then consolidating with transplant and first remission. In our experience, for patients who start off at diagnosis transplant eligible, uh, around 45% or so of patients look like they're in long-term remission, not as high as we'd want to be. What percentage is About 45%. 45%. Um, now, so, and, and in our institution, that basically means you're, you're 70 or early 70s or below with uh, a good performance status when you start. Um, you know, that's okay. Um, might we just be selecting for the complete responders? Um, we've tried to look at that and we haven't really, it's been a tough number to get at. Are we just sort of pick, picking the good responders and consolidating them? Because the patients who've done well have been uh, good responders to initial therapy. But when I look at that package, I see that as our best approach. Um, so that's sort of been our off protocol approach with all the caveats of, of the quality of the data that we're working with. We'll say on the other hand, we'll say the cons for that. Uh, Andre, what do you feel about this topic of first consolidation with auto transplant. Yeah, Mark, I think you opened a big can of worms. I think it's it's a national debate at uh, all our um, uh, expert panels, and and it happens every time when you have a non randomized non randomized phase two data because you can look at it two ways. You can like, well, that's the best data we have, and numbers kind of look good. On the other way, on the other, the other way of looking at this, well, there is uh, you selecting for the best patient, as Steve pointed out, because most of the studies you have patients who achieve complete remission, but you're comparing it to historical controls where you take refractory patients. You, so if you were able to historically pull out all the CR patients who don't receive the transplant and compare them to CR patients, that would be your data set to say, well, maybe the transplant patients do better. And the only prospective study that we have, the largest one presented by Nordic Group, Francesco D'Amore, and there are a couple others by Peter Reimer. If you look at those studies, the patients who do the best with autologous transplant, those with lower IPI score, lower PIT score, and patients who achieve complete remission, those who have high IPI, they still do poorly. So if you take better patients, take in the transplant, get good results. You take worse patients, take in the transplant, they don't do as well, but it's, it's, um, it's a double-edged sword. So I, I think exposing uh, everybody to autologous transplant is a little premature. So well, point I, counterpoint. I just make one comment. I'll <laughs> throw a bit away. Just that I don't disagree with you. I would just say in terms of saying the best patients, I, I think you know our 45 percent, and that's the same number in the Nordic study. It's it's by intent to treat, um, um, declared intent at diagnosis, and it's patients to 72, 74 with performance status two or under. So I just would push back a little bit on the best patients. I think we're not we're excluding the worst prognostic patients, but that's not a very highly selected group. Um, anyway, Last kind of point. With it. So I, okay. the, the data you, you shared with me <laughs> one time, you guys looked at the PET responses prior to transplant. Actually, yeah. those patients who are the best are those who are PET negative. Yeah. But we don't know whether those patients would do well anyway because your PET positive patients were much lower than 45%. Right, no, and I will, so since you bring that up, so our, our interim PET negative group is actually over 50% if they're high IPI at baseline and over 60% PFS if they're low IPI at baseline. So I agree. If we did a randomized study, I don't know what the results would be, but if I have a patient who's gotten four cycles of CHOP or chop atopside is in PET negative remission, and my own data shows that they're 50% or more cured by consolidating with autotransplant, I'm not willing to back off from that yet unless I have data to the contrary or I think that the transplant is quite. I'm not saying that I know that's the right answer, but, but to give that patient, what, in my experience, what their best shot is, 
that's how we've done, but, but very open that the quality of our data is, is, is very imperfect.